We will continue now into the second part of the session and our second speaker uh, of today, which is Damien Coyle from Ulster University, who is a senior lecturer, lecturer there at the School of Computing and Intelligent System. And he's going to tell us uh, or give us his perspective, at least on this broad title that we gave, gave him, uh, Bring Computer Interfaces and Neuroprosthetics. And I'm just going to transfer the presenter right to you, Damien, and then you can uh, begin with your presentation. And if you have anything to show us from your desktop, uh, you can do that as well. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as I said, I'm Damien Coy from Ulster University, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, brain-computer interfaces. Um, it's going to be a fairly general talk, but I'll focus a little bit on our, our, our work with patients in terms of offering a, a communication channel and um, trying to establish whether a patient is conscious or not. So it has some relevance in terms of consciousness to the previous talk. So as I say, I'm going to cover BCI definitions in general and then talk about motor imagery BCI specifically. And then I'll talk about consciousness assessment and cover some of our, our patient trials in that area. And then I'll cover some of the prospects and challenges along with uh, future looking uh, perspective and trends. So I hope it's relevant to the, the group of audience here today. So basically BCIs translate mere reflections of brain activity into control signals that allow people to interact with computers without movement. So the idea is to provide a movement free communication channel. Um, there's a number of definitions of BCIs, but one from Butcheller et al. Um, seems to meet with uh, most of the BCI applications. So the device must rely on signals uh, recorded directly from the brain. Uh, there, least, there must be at least one recordable brain signal that they can intentionally modulate. That's either by looking at a stimulus on a screen or intentionally imagining movement. Um, so I'm hearing a little beeping noise there. Is that is that OK? Yeah. Uh, that, that's a beeping noise from uh, people either joining or leaving the conversation. It's not something that we can do anything about, actually. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to make sure it wasn't disconnected or something. Okay, um, so the, the BCI also requires a real-time processing. So you're translating the brain activity into a control signal in real-time and then feedback to allow the person to observe the actions of their imagined movement, for example, or actions of their viewing of a stimulus. So in terms of this definition, BCIs are not equivalent to neuroprosthesis that don't require intentional modulation of uh, uh, brain activity and don't give the person real-time feedback and so on. Um, there are other definitions of BCIs, such as passive BCIs and hybrid BCIs, which involve other types of, of control signals, such as EMG or, or residual muscle activity, or even eye trackers that are mixed with the BCI designs. So the BCIs involve four main components, uh, signal acquisition, signal processing, uh, devices, and then an interface or operating system. So these are quite different to uh, what people sometimes refer to as neuroprothesis, which uh, don't require these types of uh, processes. You can see here the, the standard BCI loop where we record signals either invasively or non-invasively, and they're translated through a range of signal processing tools into a control signal that allows to, the user to influence in something on the screen. And normally there's a feedback given to the user to ensure that they can uh, learn from any activity they're providing through their brain waves um, and so on. So these are the different steps in a standard BCA. Uh, we have signal acquisition through hardware. Then we have algorithms that are used to extract as much information so feature extraction, trying to increase, increase the, the between class variance and reduce the within class variance, and then classification. And the classifier normally either, if it's a binary system, it'll provide a, a signal that is greater than zero for right arm movement or less than zero for left arm movement. Um, so it, normally a classifier might provide a continuous control signal or a binary response. On top of that, then we might have post-processing on the classifier output. Uh, if it's a if it's a continuous control signal, we'll try to smooth that or 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 do some thresholding on the classifier output. We also have the problem with BCI in terms of 
non-stationary uh, effects caused by noise, uh, day-to-day learning, the person's ability to, to change the brain and, and provide uh, different signals to improve the performance of the BCA. On top of that then, so we might do unsupervised adaptation while the person uses the BCA to adapt the features or adapt the classifier online in real time. And then obviously we have loads of different uh, parameters associated with these, and I'll talk about some of those in a minute, and they are normally tuned in an offline analysis. So just to give you a brief overview of motor imagery BCIs, um, why would we use a motor imagery BCI when we, motor imagery is basically the imagination of movement. It has been shown that the imagination of movement uh, activates similar motor areas as actual movement, and we know that some of these motor areas are fairly consistent among every individual and they're reasonably well defined where we have hand mo or foot movement in central areas over uh, central motor areas um, hand movement just left left central and right central and tongue movement there so these are fairly well spatially defined and that makes it easier to, to, to place our electrodes and try to find discriminative properties when somebody activates their brain activity through motor imagery. So there's also standard kind of patterns that we, we expect for each individual. So for example, if we imagine left arm movement, we get right hand side activity, right hand movement, we get left hand side activity, foot movement, we get central activity, and tongue movement, we get uh, activity um, laterally on the, uh, just above the ear, uh, near the auditory cortex. And Normally we see these activations as a desynchronization. So when a person is not doing any movement, there's typically a, a strong mu component, which is a, an eight to 12 hertz component um, in the frequency band. And whenever they activate the, the cortex during movement, that component is desynchronized or the, the electrical activity or neuron activity in that, that's producing that component is desynchronized and causes a increased activity in a faster component. Um, so when we desynchronize, we refer to that as event-related desynchronization or synchronization. When we look at the frequency band then, um, look at the, the, the Fourier transform for this, we can see that whenever we place an electrode C3 on the left-hand side of the cortex and C4 on the right, when we imagine left arm movement, you get right hand side activity and the, the mu component or the 8 to 12 component disappears and vice versa for right arm movement. So we can use this as a, as a feature of our, our signal and if we see high, high frequency in the mu band on the left side and low frequency in the mu band on the right side then we know that the person or we, we can, it's an indication that the person is imagining left arm movement and vice versa for right arm movement. So normally we'd record multiple trials to establish the, the best signal or the best features for each individual. And the trial would look like something like this, where they have a cue, they imagine movement according to a cue that at, at, at occurs at three seconds. Then they might imagine the movement for three to four seconds. And then they'll have a break and this will be repeated a number of times. So the imagined movement might be imagining lifting a weight with your right arm, imagine lifting weight with the left arm or squeezing a brake on the bike and we'll record signals over the motor cortex. Normally, if you use more electrodes, we get better um, spatial resolution and better accuracy, um, but typically we can use three bipolar channels over motor areas. This is just an indication of what you might see from different individuals um, when we look at their brain activity. Assuming the nose position is here, these images show the um, evolution of the difference or the correlation between a left versus right motor imagery as the person imagines the, the movement. So the blue here indicates where the, <clears throat> the channels that become most negatively correlated during the imagined movement. And you can see that typically they're over central motor areas. Um, and each individual, if they begin the imagined movement at three seconds, there's a difference a different time point at which the, the signals become maximally separable or where the, the correlation is minimal for the left versus right. And this is different for each individual. So there's a latency that's different for every individual. There's a time point at which signals become maximally separable. And there's a difference in terms of their spatial location. So 
even though there are standards and we could apply standards across all subjects, normally subject specific uh, signal feature extraction and subject specific uh, parameter tuning will work best uh, for each individual. So using motor imagery and BCIs, there's a number of reasons to do so. They're associated with cortical areas directly connected to the brain's normal output channels. Um, motor image is a skill which can be learned and improved, and it's not dependent on external stimuli, so it's referred to as an independent BCA, as opposed to a BCA that requires a stimulus presented on the screen to elicit a response in the brain activity. Um, as I said, the, the dynamics are reasonably defined spatially and spectrally, and we can, we can produce a continuous control signal with uh, the, the motor imagery as opposed to a discrete signal. So to actually translate this, we use a range of different signal processing techniques, and I'm not going to spend too long describing these now, but basically we're taking this small number of channels or multiple channels and feeding them through a range of tools to, to produce a control signal that looks something like this, where the, when they imagine movement at three seconds for left arm movement, a signal goes towards one or, or above, and for right arm movement, the signal goes down at some, up, up some point towards minus one or, or, or lower. So the, this process here is, involves time embedding the signals. So the raw EG is time embedded and using a, an embedding dimension and time lag. And then we feed them through a number of uh, fuzzy neural network prediction models, looking at the predicted output from different models that are specialized on different uh, motor imagery time series. Uh, we do the band pass filtering then. And feature extraction then after that involves the simply the um, log variance of the signals in, in specific time windows. If we don't do the classification at this point, we may also apply a common spatial patterns, which maximizes the variance for one class and minimizes it for another. And then we take the log variance of those and feed them into a classifier that will produce this signal. So in terms of that signal then, if we get a nice signal like this, when a person imagines left arm movement, we can threshold it uh, for a certain length of time. And then at the end of that time, if it's above the threshold, we can say that this is definitely a left arm movement, or if it's below a threshold, this is definitely a right arm movement. Or we can use that for continuous control of, of a ball on a screen. For example, here in this case, where the person has to move the ball into a basket, the, the ball falls continuously for three seconds. and during that time, they position the, the horizontal position of the ball on the screen by imagining left or right arm movement. If I actually look at the accuracy in doing this, we'll classify the signal. So if we're using a two second window. We'll slide the two second window and extract features and classify those at every sample point uh, as we sample the signal. And at some point, we will find that the accuracy peaks and drops off. So this is the accuracy, say for, for example, we're doing 50 left trials, 50 right hand movement trials. Um, the accuracy then is just the, the accuracy of distinguishing each trial from each of the trials from one another. So typically during no movement for this binary class, we'd have a 50% accuracy, which is a chance accuracy. And then we'd like to see this peak occurring, which corresponds to the, the, the maximal point where the, the correlation is separate, or the, the frequency band is, is minimally correlated for the two classes. So in terms of BCI applications, that's a very quick overview of motor imagery BCIs. Um, the BCI applications have been uh, looked at extensively for different uh, applications, but the core focus of many researchers is to provide alternative communication and control for people who have neuromuscular disorders as a result of uh, disease or or injury, and to try and offer them uh, alternative communication channels or alternative ways of interacting with technologies. Um, so there's quite a number of patients in, associated with BCIs, such as spinal injury, uh, disorders of consciousness, uh, brainstem stroke, and different. These have added value in different ways for, for for people. So, for example, motor neuron disease sometimes results in completely locked in syndrome. So they have no means of communication because they can't control any any muscular activity. Whereas uh, ischemic stroke, a person loses the ability to control uh, one or other upper limb or lower limb. These size can be can be used to activate brain areas that might help them regain some of that function. 
uh, through a new neurofeedback protocol. And I'll talk a little bit about spinal injury and some of the trials we've been doing, uh, but of core focus of the discussion here on is to, to outline our, our studies in disorders of consciousness. So disorders of consciousness um, are associated with normally traumatic brain injury and following uh, a period in a coma, a person will emerge from a coma state. And their level of consciousness may be, may be known, it may not be known. Uh, depending on their ability to provide overt motor responses or behavioral responses. So if a person cannot provide any behavioral responses to command, then they could often be diagnosed vegetative. And vegetative is a state where your awareness is is minimal or zero, uh, but you're, you could be awake but completely unaware of your surroundings, whereas the minimally conscious state is where your level of awareness fluctuates and there's an acceptance that you're, you're somewhat conscious, but um, it's typically unknown because, again, minimally conscious state, a person cannot provide overt behavioral responses um, that are consistent. So there's a, there's a problem with this in that the People are often misdiagnosed as being vegetative when they're, they could actually be aware, but just standard assessment tools um, cannot detect that awareness. Um, so it not often require, requires extensive and prolonged evaluation of individuals in a post-acute situation where a, a clinical team will assess their, their alertness on a daily basis and, and you know, command following gaze control and then eventually they'll have a diagnosis. But as I say, individuals who are minimally conscious state may be incapable of providing volitional overt motor responses, and this can be very, make it very difficult to, to uh, identify whether they are conscious or not. Um, so as I say, up to 40, there's been studies showing that up to 43% of patients who have received a diagnosis of vegetative state are later reclassified by clinical experts as being uh, more than just uh, vegetative, actually have some level of awareness. Recent evidence based on neuroimaging from Owen et al. and, and Cruz et al. show that uh, a subset of patients who are diagnosed vegetative actually have a level of awareness. And so basically the, the, the idea is to ask them to imagine movements and uh, looking at the brain response and visualizing the brain response then determining if there's a statistically significant difference between the brain responses and if there is then we know that the person is, has heard us, they've got language comprehension, they may have sustained attention, they've got some working memory to take part in the task and they can associate the, the instruction given to them uh, with the task. So, they've got, so a, a range of consciousness can be assessed using a, a BCI paradigm and I'm going to show a little bit about that. So determining if a non-responsive patient can comprehend and follow instructions to perform two different motor image tasks may shed light on their awareness. Uh, and this is typically achieved by assessing the accuracy and distinguishing one motor imagery from another using EEG. So it's akin to performance assessment in, in brain-computer interfaces. Another aspect of this is that motor learning and real-time feedback improves a person's ability to modulate their sensory motor cortex and uh, to learn from the feedback. And a lot of studies that looked at vegetative state hadn't provided uh, feedback. And you know, we did this in a, in a number of trials to show the patient that you know you may be able to, to influence a signal outside the body by uh, imagine movement. And you know, again, sometimes we work with able-bodied participants and. Um, physically impaired participants, and in the first few sessions, we don't see any uh, you know, clear indication that they're able to perform motor imagery or, or modulate uh, sensory motor areas uh, intentionally. Whereas over time, they learn from feedback and they learn a skill of modulating their activity. So it's important that we do this when we're assessing consciousness as well. This is just an indication of how the learning processes take place. Uh, this is a number of studies we did with spinal injury. So this basically just shows the accuracy in distinguishing left versus right arm movement with their various types of, of feedback over time. And you can see that as the person trains over multiple sessions, their accuracy improves in terms of our ability to distinguish their, their motor imagery responses. So feedback is critical to, to BCI learning. Um, and as I say, in, in the minimally conscious state diagnosis and 
and assessment. Uh, you know, it's important to let the participant experience the potential for B-size by providing feedback. So feedback may be provided as, say, using this ball or, or, or uh, ball control paradigm. It could be provided using a, a spaceship game paradigm where you basically imagine movement to move the spaceship left and right. I'm not sure if you can see those videos playing there, yes? Yes, we can. Okay, so basically the videos, uh, the video on the right shows somebody controlling a spaceship by imagining left and right are moving. This is speeded up by three times, so it's not actually this fast, but basically their objective is to dodge these uh, asteroids falling. So this is a, this is a visual feedback paradigm. Um, now working with disorders of consciousness patients, um, there's often no evidence that the person can actually see. In many cases, they close their eyes during the experiment, and therefore, visual feedback and visual cues may not be suitable for, for these patient groups. So we've developed a, a new strategy where we provide auditory feedback, uh, stereo audio feedback, where the person imagines the movement and they're, they're presented with sounds, and the sounds will pan to the left, arm, left ear if they imagine left arm movement and pan to the right ear if they imagine right arm movement. Not sure. Right. So that's pink noise being played. So pink noise is easy to localize in space. So we, 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 we begin by training this pink noise. You can't hear the stereo uh, there at the minute because it's it's just mono, but basically they will push those sounds and it'll, it'll fade out in the left ear and fade into the right ear if they imagine right arm movement. And then later we'll, we'll We'll give them more exciting feedback than pink, not pink noise. A um, little bit harder to uh, where we play a musical feedback, and they would uh, push those musical sounds to the left or right. And it's just three to four second samples, and we have a different um, palette of, of different musical feedback genres, so it makes it a little bit more interesting. And uh, typically, when a person first realizes that they're able to influence the, 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 the music or the, the sounds by imagined movement, uh, in this group, you, you do see a, a tendency to be, become more alert or a bit more attentive than they would normally be. So I'm just going to briefly go through one or two results, but uh, not spend too much time on it. So, this is what we would typically ask them in, a, in, a, in an assessment session, where they would be asked to, every time you hear a beep or see an arrow on screen, try to imagine that you're squeezing your right hand into a fist and then relaxing it. And they would do this repetitively, and we'll look at the signal uh, responses for uh, wiggle toes versus right hand. And then during the feedback, we'll have uh, either the visual feedback or the auditory feedback, all with the same critical timing paradigm, where you begin the queue at three seconds and then they get feedback for a number of seconds. And we use our standard signal processing tools. So to look at them, we look, do a leave one out cross validation on the, the signals after they've uh, after we record these multiple trials. We'll look at a baseline period uh, before they imagine movement and look at, a, at the peak when they imagine the movement and we'll see if there's a statistically significant difference between baseline and peak. And if there is, then that's a good indication that the person has has performed the task and um, they're they're actually consciously aware. They can hear. They can they can understand the language. So this is just typically, as I showed you, a response with the able-bodied participant. This is quite a good response where we get up to 95% accuracy in distinguishing left versus right. And you can see that the difference between baseline and this period is significantly different between uh, statistically significant and um, Likewise, this is a, a subject who was minimally conscious and hadn't been responsive for over 12 years following a, a brain injury as a 17-year-old. And we were able to show that in the first session that the participant um, had a clearly distinguishable response pattern. And this was uh, quite exciting for the consultants involved because they didn't realize that this person was had any uh, consciousness based on their standard assessments. So I've got, we've followed four patients with this kind of protocol over, over a number of sessions, and uh, we've all, they're all diagnosed minimally conscious, and they all show uh, uh, responses indicating uh, strong awareness, strong consciousness. 
and this is reported in a, in a recent study in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. So this just shows with different types of feedback over time, the participant, one of our participants, continually tries to modulate brain activity and actually begins to improve here. And we're continually following this patient. Hopefully, if we can get it to a point where we can consistently reach a, a reliable 85 to 90 percent accuracy, then we could possibly use this as a as a communication where they imagine left arm movement to answer yes and right arm movement to answer no. And that would mean quite a lot to uh, families and the, the participants as well. Okay, in certain terms of the accuracies there, we're, we're typically fluctuating around 70 to 80%. And, um, you know, this this is a challenge for BCA in terms of we need continuous uh, learning over time and a number of sessions. And, you know, a lot of studies have shown that this could be up to months, if not longer, of training to get to a reliable accuracy. Um, so this is one of the key challenges for BCA. This is an experiment that was conducted in around 2001, showing that a person had taken part in 62 one-hour sessions before they reached a level of accuracy that could be used consistently and reliably. Um, so this was 2001. Technology has moved on since then, and we can get accuracy typically a lot earlier than that, but it just gives you an indication of the of the timelines involved here. Um, you know, it's, it's a skill that people are developing to intentionally modulate their brain activity. So trying to do that with, you know, in a research framework where you follow patients for, for quite a long time is, is a challenge. Um, and, you know, it might be good to try and get it into a more consumer type application where people would willingly use it on a daily basis and try and monitor that through some cloud-based mechanism so that we can see how we how the, the effect of learning over over long longer periods uh, could could uh, improve performance. So just in terms of those disorders of consciousness trials, um, motor image B size could be applied in this area. So this is a critical need area in terms of diagnosis and assessment, but then trying to establish you know just a basic communication channel. Um, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that people really want this now, and this could be some of the earlier adopters of, of BCI technologies. You know, this is one comment from a participant in our studies, um, one of their fathers, saying that, you know, that this was something that offered hope to their participant. This was reported in a, a recent report by the Nuffield Council on Bioethics uh, on novel neurotechnologies. So just looking at a, at a group of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or motor neuron injury patients, the, you know, the, the indicators of quality of life indicate that communication is, is one of the key indicators of quality of life. Without communication, then people, you know, are, are feel that, that life is, is less uh, livable. So it's important that we try to offer communication to people who are in these um, minimally conscious states or in locked in syndrome and BCIs can offer that uh, because there are limited options for these people. Other views from other patients we've worked with, you know, um, work with spinal injury patients. Um, spinal injury, you know, people are often fully cognitively aware and can control uh, various assistive, assistive technologies with uh, other technologies. You know, one woman in our trials could control a wheelchair with, a, with, a, with her mouth. Uh, better than I could with two hands. So BCIs don't really offer any added value in terms of communication for these patients for, for spinal injured in that sense. But she was really interested in the fact that she was able to play a computer game with, with the BCI. Another guy we worked with, uh, you know, we used to play the PlayStation with his, his, his kid. And since he had a spinal injury, he couldn't do that. So he he was keen to, to use a BCI to, to play against his his child and um, then he could compete on an even playing field and so there there's just two examples of desires from patients in these groups there's always the question David, of, David, yeah. David, sorry for interrupting uh, i just wanted to ask you uh, perhaps if you could wrap up in the next couple of minutes so that we can also get to dave lester as a commentator and and leave a little bit of time for audience questions okay sorry yep That's okay yep. okay thank you um, so, yeah, just 
invasive versus non-invasive, you know, there, there's quite a lot of evidence to show that invasive can give you more reliable signals, but um, the, there's no consistent evidence that it could be that it could be any better than non-invasive EEG recordings. Um, there's been evidence that we can do three-dimensional control with with non-invasive EEG. There are a range of challenges, um, you know, identifying the most appropriate mental tasks, some of the safety critical issues if we're going to use it B size for robotics. Um, communication rates are still very low with B size. There are ways of improving that. Um, so we've developed a technology there where we can um, access multiple different buttons by still performing two motor imagery, uh, where we move this up with left arm movement, move this up with right arm movement, and we can access these. Uh, these activities circle rotating by stopping the circles as the, the feedback bars uh, exceed a threshold. So in terms of ethical issues, you know, there's quite a range of different things that have been associated with this, such as involuntary or third party control of prosthesis or wheelchairs if the BCI is, is hooked to a wheelchair, um, you know, whether or not a, B a person using a BCI is fully in control, you know, if, if, if a prosthesis or, or some other prosthetic um, causes harm to somebody else, who's at fault? Is it the, the prosthetic provider or the prosthetic uh, user? Um, so the Nuffield Council have reported on the ethical issues surrounding B size and they've made a number of key recommendations. Um, so I, I really advise reading that if you're interested in the ethical issues surrounding neuro, novel neurotechnologies. Key thing is to manage expectations when people are participating in trials, um, and the virtue of responsibility requires that the research have a, in place appropriate arrangements to protect participants. Just in terms of technology diffusion, BCIs are showing indications of early adoption, and you know prices are coming down in terms of the hardware and so on. So they're they're already following the the trends of typical technology diffusion. So it's important to consider some of the challenges and, uh, and the ethical issues. Just an indication is that the number of consumer grade EEG sets, headsets has increased in recent years. Um, and this is kind of driven by multiple driving forces such as continued advances in underlying science and technology, increasing demand for solutions to repair the nervous system, you know, the aging population and the, the, the need for assistive technologies as well as the non uh, the, the, the demand for non-medical brain computer interfaces. In terms of the future, there's there's a acceptance that you know going from getting the information out of the brain through the, the, the normal channels, there is a bottleneck there and people expect that brain computer interface, uh, if improved, can can reduce that bottleneck where we can provide direct information from the brain to the computer as opposed to going through the the muscular channels, which uh, have no reduce the semantics from from going from brain to computer. Okay, so that's basically wrapped up. Sorry for running over there. If I, if I did, um, I'm happy to take any questions on the. It's very brief overview of of BCI and and some of the stuff that we've been doing. Thank you, Damien, very much for this very fascinating overview of all the different things and and all the possible applications, or at least some of them that, that you are working with. I think it's, it's really very interesting. Before, I have a couple of audience questions, but before that, I would like to give now the, the floor to Dave Lester, who's commenting on, on your talk. Um,